The last few tech videos, we've been going over tools that will help you de-Google, like password management and setting up your own file hosting, but this video is a little bit more in line with de-Facebooking by setting up your own personal website. Most websites have three major components that kind of interplay with one another. The first thing is the web server, which directs all traffic to the website. That's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to set up an operating system with the install, and then we're going to set up the web server. The other two parts are the file system, which includes programs through PHP, and also some of the text files for display on the website, and the database. I use Grav. Grav is kind of a cross between an HTML website that doesn't have a database and a WordPress, which has a database and a file system and all kinds of software running in the background. But I ran some updates and I broke some of the images on my website. You can see in this mobile view right here, I broke the image for the hamburger menu on the mobile version of my website and that needs to be addressed. So with Grav 1.7 coming out in a couple of weeks, I'm setting up a dev environment on my local system. You can use these steps if you want to set up a virtual box with a dynamic DNS provider to go to your home network if you don't want to pay for web hosting. That's definitely a viable option. So let's get into going through the install of Ubuntu server and then turning that into a web server, which will get us through the first half of what we would need to do to install Grav. First thing I'm going to do here, I did a dry run on this before, I'm going to remove this Ubuntu server and delete all of the files. And we will do a clean setup by clicking new. And calling it Ubuntu server. Right now I'm going to change this to a different place on my computer because this disk right here is a spinning disk and I would much prefer this to be on a solid state disk. So we're going to switch over and now we can choose that directory for VirtualBox. You can see it already exists and I'm going to click Next. For this setup, on DigitalOcean where I do my hosting, I think I usually give my server 512 megs of space because it's headless. And that's really what we're setting up here, but I'm going to give it 2 gigs of RAM just in case it helps a little bit with the speed of the install. So I'll click Next, create the virtual hard disk now. VirtualBox disk image, that's perfect for our use. And I want this to be fixed in size. 10 gigs is a little bit lean for me, so let's bump that up to 16 or 17. My DigitalOcean account uses 20 gigs of space, but I think I only use about two of those. So we'll create that. This is going to take a couple minutes. I'm going to pause the video until it's done. And once it's done, you should see a, another icon right over here that says Ubuntu server. See you in a minute. All right, you can see that Ubuntu server is set up. Now this is a virtual disk and there is space allocated on my hard drive, but one of the things that I still need to do is install Ubuntu server. So with this, we can select this uh, Ubuntu server right here. There's something else we can do right now, but I'll save it for later. For networking, if we're going to access it from, say, this desktop environment, not, not this virtual box, but just the general environment, the web browser on this system, we need the adapter to be set to bridged. And we can do that right now, and we'll be able to see the IP address when we do the install, and everything will be much smoother. But I'm going to intentionally miss this step in case any of you make this mistake, which I did several times kind of going through this and uh, and testing out the setup. So I'll click Start, and we will see that this is the server right here, but there is no operating system installed. 
This is the installation pathway and it already selects Ubuntu server from my downloads folder. Again, this is because I've done it before. If it doesn't point to the right folder, you'll just have to navigate to it using the file navigation right here. Okay, by trying to show you how to navigate around, it looks like I actually created a failure. So let's see if I can troubleshoot how to get this set up so that the disk will install. So the first thing I'm going to do to troubleshoot this is I'm going to check out the disk drive. Storage. All right, so if you make that mistake, you can go ahead and you can click on the server settings here. Go to storage. And then add that to your optical storage drive right here. So live CD, you should be able to click start and it should start the installation process. And it looks like that actually worked. But here in a minute it will start the installation procedures and start asking questions. The first question is going to be what keyboard do you want to use? Oh, okay, so the first question is English. Is that the language you want? Of course, I'm speaking to you in English. And I will update with the new installer. I've tried this before, updating without the updated installer, and it didn't really save me any time. Or not that I would notice, and definitely not that you will notice, because I'm going to pause the video when we go through the actual installation process. So the keyboard, English US, perfect. Now this is what I mean by the Ethernet controller needing to be bridged. You can see here it's set up for ENP0, S3, Ethernet, and uh, CIDR notation, which is 10.0.2.15. That doesn't really help us. I'm on a 192.168.1 type network, so. No proxy, that's fine. Using the entire disk is exactly what we want because we set aside a virtual di disk exactly for this purpose. Click done. That makes sense. And ignore the warning as far as wiping the disk and damaging your data because this is a virtual machine. For this part, we're going to just enter in my name and a throwaway password because this is not going to be connected to the outside internet in any way. It's only going to be connected on my internal network. We do need SSH or OpenSSH installed because I want to putty into this system. The reason I want to putty into the system is so that I can adjust my font size because this is a 4K monitor and putty allows a little bit more flexibility as far as window sizing. We don't need any of this software here. Click OK. And now it's going to install the kernel. While this installs, I'm going to pause the video so that you're not waiting around. There's nothing really special, no questions or prompts that you have to answer, so I'll see you on the other side. All right, our installation is complete at this point. We can go ahead and click Reboot. It's going to ask you to eject the CD media. You don't need to do that because it's not even really in there, so just go ahead and close. Oh, you know what? You have to press Enter. So you press Enter for the machine to shut down. Now I'm going to power it off before it reboots and just show you the next steps here. So remember during setup everything was in CIDR notation, so it was 10.0.2.15. Uh, we are going to change this to use a bridged network adapter so that we can actually connect in using PuTTY or access it from our local network here. 
Before I do that, I'm just going to show you one of the powerful things about virtual machines. You can just go ahead and so this one has Ubuntu set up. We can clone it and just call it Ubuntu Server Clone and then do a full clone and then we have all of our progress so far completely saved. This is one of the reasons why I'm doing this for my dev environment is if I want to get really aggressive with how I treat my website and mess around with PHP files or anything like that, I can always keep a backup and then revert at any given time by just switching over to the clone system or only making significant changes on a clone system. So we're going to go in here, we're going to pop into settings to change our networking adapter to a bridged adapter. So under network, you can see that this is set to NAT. When you set bridged adapter, it selects the Ethernet adapter for the host computer. In this case, it's my desktop running Manjaro Linux. So I'll just go ahead and click OK, and we can start the machine. Now we can't putty in immediately because I don't know what the IP address is. There's a couple of options for this. Number one, I could go into my router and find out what the IP address is through the router, or I can ask the Ubuntu system what my IP address is. And I'm going to show you how to do that right now. We need to type in IFW config, but net tools are not installed in many Linux distributions by default. So what we'll do is we will do a sudo app update and update the system. And then we will do a sudo apt upgrade. And then we'll just upgrade all of the outstanding packages. Once this is done, we'll do a sudo apt install net dash tools. We'll see that in just a moment. I'm going to pause the video while these updates run so that you're not waiting on it. All right, the update's done running. So now we can run sudo sudo apt install net dash tools, as I said before. And we'll just click yes when it asks us. Oh, it didn't ask. So now that we have net tools installed, we can type in if config. On a Windows machine, the same command is ipconfig, and it will give virtually the same information back to you. So we can see this first section here, ENP0S3, that's my Ethernet adapter, INET 192.168.1.16. So when we go into PuTTY, we can connect to exactly that server. So I'll pull PuTTY over here. And I will type in 192.168.1.16. And I'm going to save this as virtual server. Now, like I said before, I do want to adjust the font size. This is a 4K monitor, so it's a bit difficult to, for me to read at 100%, which I think is 10 point font. So I'll go ahead and change that to Deja Vu Sans Mono, and I will set that to 16 so that I can read a little bit better. And then go back here and save. Now I should be able to open up this server. It's going to give you this warning that this is an unknown server, but since it's running on exactly the machine we're running on right now, I don't think there's any risk that there's a virus. So we'll accept that risk and pull this out. This virtual box is set to, I think, 640 by 480. The problem is, is if we try and adjust the size or the fonts or anything like that, it's really not going to do anything for us. It, it won't adjust with us. 
the nice thing about using putty is number one it's going to be good just as far as user experience consistency because when I go to put my main website on the digital ocean I'm going to be using putty but it's also nice because I can resize it and I can see more commands on the window at any given time so I'll just go ahead and log in all right so something that's zero percent necessary for this because it's on my personal network but is just a good standard practice whenever you're installing a web server is setting up the firewall so what we're going to do is we will ufw app list and click enter i have to be root to be able to do that so a little trick that Mental Outlaw made a video about a couple days ago, to rerun a previous command, you, you use two exclamation points. So you do sudo and then two exclamation points and it will rerun the last command as a super user doing it. And we can see that open SSH is available. So now we can do sudo ufw allow open ssh and now our firewall has open ssh as a permitted application now we can turn the firewall on without risk of being booted out of putty so ufw step uh, enable and of course sudo Now we can click allow because we already permitted SSH access even with the firewall. So I'm just going to click yes and enter. And we should be able to clear this so that we're back to a relatively clean screen. Now if we type in UFW status, we'll see that open SSH is available in IPv4 and IPv6. So everything's perfect there. And now for the final part, which is installing the web server and verifying it. We already ran sudo apt update and sudo apt upgrade before we installed net tools. So we don't have to worry about that for engine X. So we will just go sudo apt install engine X and we will prevent the system to use the amount of disk space requested. Now to determine if we want to allow Nginx to be on the firewall or which version of Nginx, we can type in ufw sudo ufw app list. And we can see that we have three options. We have Nginx full, Nginx HTTP, and Nginx HTTPS. Generally, with any kind of firewall, you want least privileges possible. So in most cases, I would say that for a local system, you could go with Nginx HTTP. But on my main server, when I put this up on my regular website, I want HTTP available so that it can reroute to HTTPS, which means that I will have both necessary to be open. So in this case, I will allow Nginx full. So that's sudo ufw allow Nginx full and the rule is added. If you click up, you can see your past actions. So we can see sudo ufw status. And we can see that Nginx is enabled. Now with a web browser, we can go ahead and verify this. And simply 
I will turn off mobile view and then close the developer window. Now we can go to 192.168.1.16 and it says welcome to Nginx. This is good if we go to the Nginx file on our system using PuTTY, we can see that it looks exactly like this written in HTML. Websites are normally housed in ver www html and if you do ls you will see that index.nginx-debian.html is in there so we can sudo nano or vim if that's your thing of course if you're using vim you're probably not watching my videos and we can see welcome to nginx Welcome to Nginx. So the web server is set up, it's running. So this is the first half, which is a little bit more generic. The second part will be actually setting up Grav CMS, and I will leave that for another video. Thanks for stopping by, signing out.